Hello, welcome to our Knife River Lutheran Church virtual worship service. This virtual service is taking the place of in building worship for Sunday, February 28th, 2021. This morning we are observing the second Sunday in the season of Lent. Please take note of the announcements you receive. I especially want to mention though that our annual meeting is this morning, the 28th at 10 a.m. online on Zoom. You can access that meeting either through the information included in the bulletin or through the link you have received through the email. And I do encourage you to attend the meeting. It will be short, but we do need a quorum. We just want to get our business done. And it is actually fun to see everyone's face, even if just in a little square on the screen. So please do come and join in that annual meeting today at 10 a.m. There are also information about two Lenten studies that are happening now during this season. There is an email study that goes out on Mondays from Lyle Northey. And there is a group study that meets Wednesday evenings virtually led by Randy Alrek. You may still join in either of those. Check those out. Finally, next Sunday, our council will be meeting at 10 a.m. So there's a heads up for council members. We then begin our service. In the name of God the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. O oh God, by the passion of your blessed Son, you made an instrument of shameful death to be for us the means of life. Grant us so to glory in the cross of Christ that we may gladly suffer shame and loss for the sake of your Son. Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. But when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the things of God, but the things of men. Then he called the crowd to him, along with his disciples, and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. What good is it for a man to gain the whole world, and yet forfeit his soul? Or what can a man give in exchange for his soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. Brothers and sisters in Christ, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Karl Barth was one of the most important theologians of the last century, and he was famed for advising Christians that we should hold our Bible in one hand and our newspaper in the other. In other words, there should be a dialogue of sorts between scripture and current events. I had this experience last week when I held our scripture text in one hand and my cell phone with my digital newspaper in the other hand and observed how the two interacted. Our scripture text today is rather somber in keeping with the traditional emphasis of the Lenten season. It speaks of suffering, 
of self-denial, of taking up one's cross and following Jesus. All that was in one hand, so to speak. In the hand holding my digital newspaper, there was a story describing how President Biden and others had marked the deaths of 500,000 Americans from the COVID-19 virus. Also a somber kind of text in its own way. I found at least two ways in which these two hands and texts were in conversation involving suffering and self-denial. First of all, I was staggered by the suffering in that news article, by the sheer number of deaths, 500,000, more than died in both world wars and other conflicts, all within one year. If we reason that at least several people mourn each of those deaths, you have millions who are grieving and suffering loss, to say nothing of all those suffering from the illness itself or from the impact of the illness on our society. There has been a lot of suffering in our world in that newspaper hand, and our biblical text, in the other hand, addresses suffering. But I was also dismayed by the second way these two hands worked in conversation with each other. I was startled to learn that although our country represents just 5% of the world's population, we have had the single greatest number of deaths of any nation in the world. How disheartening is that? How will history judge our national efforts to curb this virus and preserve the health of our fellow citizens? My suspicion is that that high number relates at least in part to our lack of willingness culturally to embrace the values of the scripture text. I think our society is loath to deny ourselves that we tend to value our individual ease and convenience above all else, which is not the lifestyle Jesus holds up for followers. Self-denial, cross-bearing, these are not culturally popular values at all. So the current events context in which we hear this lesson, it certainly highlights some of the challenges of the text for us. The historical context of this lesson is also significant. By this time in Mark's Gospel, Jesus has exercised demons, preached repentance, told parables, fed 5,000 people with a few loaves and fishes, walked on water, stilled a stormy sea, and worked many miracles of healing. It's been a busy time. And it's also been a time in which Jesus has made an enormous impression garnering large crowds and great popularity. Immediately prior to our verses today, Jesus asks his disciples, first, who do others say that he is? And secondly, who do they say that he is? It's Peter who answers him, you are the Messiah, which means Christ, the anointed one of God. Peter has just made his great confession of faith. Go, Peter. And now in the very next moment, Peter is about to get it all wrong as our text begins. Because Jesus plainly outlines what God's plan is for him as the Messiah, that he will suffer, be rejected, be killed, and rise again. Jesus is trying to do some reality therapy with his disciples he wants to prepare them for hardships lying ahead. But Peter just isn't having any of that. In Peter's mind, the Messiah wouldn't suffer or be rejected or be killed. It just wouldn't happen. So although Peter has just acknowledged Jesus as the Messiah, he figures Jesus must be confused. He needs a little help to sort out what it means to be the Messiah. So we read in our lesson, Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Peter doesn't believe that Christ knows Christ's job as well as Peter does. Peter doesn't trust God to be God. Peter also doesn't want to acknowledge the counter-cultural nature of God's plan. Peter wanted a Messiah who would be carrying out 
Peter's own agenda, which was one shared by the majority of Jews at that time. Peter wanted a Messiah who would go from strength to strength, glory to glory, and lead the Jews in a successful revolt against the Roman Empire that occupied and oppressed them. Peter couldn't grasp that God's plan was to change the world through sacrifice and love rather than might and military prowess. So the way Peter wanted the world to be and God to act diverged from how God saw the world and intended to act. Given that Peter is often the stand-in for us in these stories, there's a decent chance that we might react likewise. You know, God often maybe doesn't meet our expectations either in terms of how we want the world to be or how we think God should act. It's kind of a problem, and it's a problem common to most every person of faith. The traditional and very legitimate way to read these verses that follow this interesting interaction between Jesus and Peter is to hear them as a call from Jesus to us, his followers. A call to embrace a lifestyle including suffering and self-denial as opposed to one including glory, high profit margins, and self-aggrandizement. Jesus says, if any want to be my followers, let them deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Again, Jesus is trying to do some reality therapy. He's being very clear. Following him isn't just about the miracles and the wonders that have been happening up to this point. Following him also involves self-denial and cross-bearing. Jesus feels passionately about this mission, so much so that when Peter tells him, that just can't be right, Jesus responds, get behind me, Satan. You are setting your mind not on divine things, but on the ways of this world. He actually tells Peter that the way Peter thinks is in line with Satan, this temptation to live just for one's own gain and profit. That's not the way of the gospel. Jesus won't compromise on this. All of this is true, but I do want to suggest an additional way of looking at these words about suffering and self-denial and cross-bearing. I think they can be heard not only as a call to action, from Jesus to us, they can also be heard as a realistic description of how things already are as we live in this world while embracing the values of God's kingdom over worldly success. Maybe that seems like a subtle distinction, but here's the implication. Perhaps rather than calling us to do something other or more than we already are, Jesus is helping us to understand what we already experience in this life as we follow him, as we are already practicing kingdom values like self-denial, cross-bearing, and encountering suffering. Particularly in light of how that news in the digital newspaper hand relates to the scripture passage in the other hand, I'm guessing we are already not strangers to the reality of suffering, self-denial, and cross-bearing. I'd encourage us to consider these words not so much as a battle cry to find some grand new path of service and martyrdom, but rather to find in these words some understanding why life does involve suffering and to honor the self-denial and cross-bearing that happen already quite naturally when we seek God's kingdom. Here's what I mean. I'm thinking of parents working from home, assisting their children with distance learning and trying to sustain their family's well-being. I'm thinking of teachers teaching from their bedrooms or in empty classrooms, trying to enable children to learn under all manner of circumstances. I'm thinking of the clerks at Super One working extra hours to compensate for those who are sick or having to quarantine and coming into contact with all kinds of people all the time. I'm thinking of anyone in healthcare who has risked their own health to provide care for others. 
I'm also thinking of the husband or wife who is already caring for a beloved spouse at home with dementia or depression or cancer. I'm thinking of the husband or wife or adult child whose spouse or parent is in a care center and they can only visit them rarely and under special circumstances. I'm thinking of people who have put themselves out one way or another to assist a neighbor, a friend, a community member in need, maybe financially, maybe emotionally, or maybe helping with transportation or groceries. I'm thinking of all of us, weary to the bone of being masked and socially distant, but still looking out for the welfare of others by being responsible and careful. All of these are acts of people living under the values of God's kingdom, walking in the way of Jesus as opposed to embracing a worldly view in which profit, convenience, and success are the bottom line. And if one looks instead to follow in the way of God's kingdom, one will inevitably end up suffering and sacrificing because the way of the kingdom is love, and love always includes some degree of self-denial, cross-bearing, and sacrifice. It just does. This shouldn't surprise us. Jesus tells it that it will be this way. But he also tells us that this way, this walk with him under the values of God's kingdom, is the way to life fuller and richer life right now, and life beyond this world and life, resurrected life. Which doesn't mean that when we are involved in suffering, in self-denial and cross-bearing, that we won't feel anxious, doubtful, put upon, or all of the above. We may well. But it does mean that when we are involved in such things, it's not purposeless. It's not in vain. It's not without meaning. We are doing it for love. We are doing it as those who live under the values of God's kingdom. We are doing it as those who follow Jesus and walk in his way. We are living as God calls us to live, and we are on the road that leads to life. Amen. of God, we pray boldly for the church, the world, and all in need. Your gift of grace is for all people. Give us confident faith that we may follow you wholeheartedly. Give all believers joy in your promises. Give hope and courage to those who suffer for their faith. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. All the ends of the earth worship you. From galaxies to microorganisms, preserve your creation. Teach humanity to wonder at your works and to join you in tending to creation's well-being. 
Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. You rule over the nations. Raise up advocates for peace and justice within and between nations. Give life where hope seems dead. Call into existence new realities we cannot even imagine. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. In Jesus, you joined humanity in suffering and death. Reveal to all the depths of your love shown on the cross. Accompany all who suffer in body, mind, and spirit. Restore all who are sick or grieving. Bring vindication for victims of injustice, exploitation, and oppression. Hear us, O God. Your mercy is great. We entrust ourselves and all our prayers to you, O faithful God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord's face shine on you and may God be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with kindness and give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We go in peace to love and serve the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thank you.